Howard Ruff, our guest, how you can prosper during the coming bad years. Uh, they'll spend it, regardless of how much they collect in taxes, direct taxes from in, uh, corporate taxes, personal taxes. They collect $450, $450 billion, they want to spend $500 billion, they spend $500 billion. They impose the inflation tax. They issue money to okay. pay, okay. to pay for it. That dilutes the value of your money. Uh, your, if they issued enough money there to, say, create a 10% inflationary spiral, you have lost 10% purchasing power of your savings. It's just as if the government came in and ripped off 10% of your capital. You didn't vote for a tax on savings. You didn't vote for a tax on capital. You didn't fill in any form. No, but you got it. Yeah. And no, and no congressman or senator had to go on record as being in favor of taxing your savings. That's what's so sneaky about it. It's deceitful. It's dishonest. It's a form of a tax. Okay, what would happen then to our rate of inflation if all of a sudden next year the, balance, the budget was balanced? What would that do to the rate of inflation? Well, the rate of inflation would uh, would be stopped cold in its tracks. It'd take about six months for it to happen, but because it takes that long for money supply changes to affect the price levels. But uh, but it would also have some other horrible side effects. It would be much too painful for us to consider politically. Uh, the uh, if you balance the budget, the first thing would have to be f done was the, the fight would have to be enjoined in Washington over whose ox gets gored. Yeah. Because uh, there's only one, two ways to balance the budget. One is to increase taxes, which is not going to happen in this tax revolt era. And the other is to cut spending. Well, if you cut spending, whose ox gets gored? Uh, your benefits from government are inflationary. Mine are social justice. You understand that? <laughs> so uh, that political battle is one the politicians will avoid at all costs. That's why you will never see a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. They will fight it, they will, they will derail it, they'll do everything they can, and they'll defeat it. And, and that's why we see stories in every edition of almost any newspaper now, horror stories out of Washington, as to what tragedies will befall us if we attempt to balance the budget. Well, sure, and that's why you see uh, uh, congressmen and senators telling governors that if their state votes for a constitutional uh, convention to balance a budget, that... Uh, uh, they should consider what part of the state's revenue sharing they would like to have cut off. Interesting. Howard Ruff, our guest. We'll be back in just a moment. The increase in prices... Can that basically be considered inflation? No. No, that's a symptom of inflation. Uh, that's a symptom. Look like to me, that is inflation. No. In words. That's if, you, if you don't define inflation correctly, then it could sound like it. Inflation in all times and all places has been a monetary phenomenon. It's been caused by increases in the money supply, which causes uh, increases in prices, and then wages uh, uh, people want to keep up, so they demand increases in wages, which adds costs, and so prices have to be increased, etc. But the whole, th whole thing never would have started if it hadn't been for increases in the money supply, and it can't be sustained unless you have increases in the money supply. I guess to say that increases or, or the, the increase in prices, to say that that is inflation is like saying that a speedometer needle sitting on 70 miles an hour is speed. When it is not, it's just an indication just of the speed. Just a measurement of it, right. Or just a measurement of it. Sure. But people look at it that way. They're, they're, the prices go up and they say, oh goodness, look what inflation is doing to me. Yeah, well, and in fact, because people do look at it that way, that's why government can get away with pointing the finger at big business and big labor and blaming them uh, I saw a movie recently, The Warriors, which has gotten a lot of controversy. And yes. In the early stages of that movie, the, all the gangs in New York gather, and they're going to all unite and take over the city. And some punk shoots this very charismatic leader who's leading them, and then points at the Warriors and says, they did it, I saw them do it. Well, in my opinion, government is just like that punk that shot the guy and blamed, blamed the wrong guy. And it's easy to blame big business and big labor. Heck, they're not very lovable. Does Jimmy very Carter busy. know, do the politicians, the senators, the congressmen, the the uh, the budget folks, do they know what causes inflation, but they just refuse to be honest with the American people? Beyond question. I know what Jimmy Carter is being told, and I know who's telling him. I know what he's being advised. I know people have sat down and met with him, and they've all agreed on the subject. Uh, Jimmy Carter knows. Absolutely. No question. But he will it. not address himself to he it. He will not address himself to it. It's not politically expedient to do so. Uh, I'm very cynical about the political process. Uh, You're in the, the right place, then. The uh, capability of misleading uh, when it suits people's advantages to do so. Uh, let me tell you what, what this whole okay, is. We have about 30 seconds before a break, but go ahead and you can start oh. on it. Okay. Well, I think I can cover it. Uh, the thing that concerns me about the government's inflation fighting program is that without any statutory authority whatsoever, they are imposing upon themselves, taking upon themselves the right to bully people 
into, into sticking with wage and price guidelines that nobody voted into existence that are not justified by law. They will boycott, they will demonstrate, they'll do everything. And the history of tyranny is the history of government stepping outside their constitutional authority, their statutory authority, to impose their will on people through bullying. The government's form of bankruptcy is inflation. They pay back with cheaper dollars. Now, the bankrupt might pay, uh, if you went bankrupt, you might pay 15% on the dollar for what you borrowed, right? Mm, okay. Maybe. Okay. If anything. If, if anything, sure. But uh, by the time the assets are divided up and paid to creditors, it's usually some small fraction of the dollars, if there's anything there. Okay. Government declares bankruptcy through inflation. They will pay back a few cents on the dollar. They will pay back with money of less uh, purchasing power than what they borrowed. The Germans did the classic example of this in 1923. They paid off all their debt at the end of their inflation to the Fennig. Nobody lost any any money. All they lost was the ability of the money to buy anything. The Germans paid off their entire national debt with money which had the total purchasing power, the total aggregate purchasing power of one American penny. In other words, it was just paper. It was worth more as, right. as fuel. That's bankruptcy. That's, that is bankruptcy. Inflation is the government's form of bankruptcy. Two six one nine seven six four, and uh, you're on Ring Radio. Yes, sir. I, I wanted to comment on inflation. I used to work for the railroad. We used to get a raise every once in a while. I worked for the railroad at night and worked on other jobs in the daytime. I've done pretty well by working hard. I'm about 70 some old years old now. And I've watched this thing go up and down. You don't have to go to school to have some sense. Anybody that knows that big business raises the price of everything every two or three weeks is the cause of our inflation. It's not the federal government. It's big business. My friend, you are the victim of the most uh, vicious brainwashing plot in history. If, if, you if you believe that, sir, you're wrong. I respect the fact that you've come to the conclusion that you've worked hard all your life, but you're wrong. You're just plain, flat, out, dead wrong. But that's what they'd like you to believe, isn't it? And they've got you, sir. They've got you. You're believing it. And uh, my, the thing that disturbs me is that there isn't an economist, a, a reputable, honest economist around who does not understand and agree with that, that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It's caused by government. Now, it's caused by government with our approval. We, we vote for it. We vote for the programs that cause it. We didn't say, uh, let's vote for 10% inflation or not but we vote for the things that cause it. Mm -hmm. And the banks like it. The uh, big New York banks love in a little bit of inflation because they make a good m amount of their money by loaning money to governments who spend more than they take in. Government securities is a very important part of their profit structure. If governments didn't spend more than they take in, there would be no government securities to buy. But as lo the government is evidently quite successful. Jimmy Carter uh, and uh, others of his ilk, they seem to be quite successful, like with this gentleman that just talked, in convincing people that uh, you, get a, you get some automaker to increase the price of its cars, and that is what is causing inflation. And as long as a significant number of the people in this country believe that, the government will never be put into a position where they have to, where they have to correct the real cause of inflation, their Absolutely. deficit policies. All you have to do is look at the financial statements, the annual reports of manufacturing firms. You can see that their return on investment is really very modest. Profits are not good in relation to sales. There are uh, people in the American business marketplace who have exorbitant profits uh, generally find that price competition moving into that market to capitalize on these marvelous profit margins eventually competitively drives them right back down. That's why you can go across industry after industry, go across company after company that, that reports its earnings publicly, and you will see that they all earn about the same return on investment. They all fight the same struggles to make a profit. There is not a, nothing is exorbitant across the board in American industry. In fact, my concern is that profits are being squeezed in American industry to the point where they do not have the money to expand, to replace obsolete plant and equipment, to create jobs so that gentleman there has a job on the railroad. It's the reinvestment of profits that is the key to the success of, of the whole free enterprise system. Okay, when we get back, uh, if, if you have the figure on the top of your head, what percentage of available investment capital does government take through their borrowing procedures, and what kind of effect does that have on us, if any, if you would spend just a minute attacking that if you have the figures available. We'll be back in a moment. 
who's to blame and what it's doing to us. The title of your book, though, is How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years, and you don't spend all that much time in the book describing how bad it's going to be. You just you spend a lot of the time in the book telling people what they can do right now to make sure it doesn't catch them. Now, what, what is the most important thing that the average American person out there listening to this show right now can do to, to, uh, to cover himself, so to speak? I mean, take Will Rogers' advice. Will Rogers, you know, the great noted, the noted economist and financial advisor, right. Will Rogers? Heard of him. He said, invest in inflation, it's the only thing that's going up. Now, he was trying to be funny, but that was real good advice, and you can do it. Inflation can be a friend or an enemy. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, let's take shoes. Okay. Uh, shoes, uh, would you care to lay odds on whether or not the price of shoes will be higher or lower uh, two years from now? Oh, sure, I'll lay odds will be higher. Okay, fine. In inflation, most everything's going up in price, so it shouldn't be very hard to find something to invest in. And people need shoes. That's right. So if you bought a two-year supply of shoes, assuming that your feet will remain the same size for the next two years, and you'll be walking two years from now, uh, and you own them and the price of shoes go up, the value of your holdings is increased. However, mm. if you have to wait two years and buy them, the price of shoes went up, and it's taking a bigger chunk of your pocketbook. Okay. Okay, there's a very important principle. Buying on sales especially and stockpiling a year or two supply of anything you use up and consume on a regular basis, shoes, jeans, spark plugs, distributor parts, flashlight batteries, toilet paper, light bulbs, you name it. You stockpile those things, buy ahead on sale, and I will guarantee you at least a 30% a year tax-free return on your money, especially if you buy them in sales when they're 20% well, off. Well, that's something any family off. can do. Oh, sure. Any family can go out and get an, an extra dozen rolls of toilet paper. Absolutely. But you want to really get enough to really look further ahead down the road than, than uh, six extra weeks. Dozen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, basically, what I'm saying is that rather... It, it's the same as if that you... That go for uh, food, too? Par pardon me for interrupting, but you include food in that? Sure. I include okay. food in that. So things have good shelf life, and you can put on your shelves and keep for a year or two. Right. Now... Let's say that you went out and found an investment that increased 40% in the next year, and then you sold it at a profit, gave Uncle Sam his piece of it in taxes, and then went out to buy something that had gone up 30%. You'd break even, right? Because your Maybe. investment profits are chewed up in the cost of the things you have to buy. Okay. Maybe. At, in the best case, you break even. So avoid the middleman. <laughs> Go out and buy now the thing that you would have sold that investment to buy two years from now. Go buy it now. Avoid the avoid the whole investment process, can, typical investment can process. Can you give us an example on that? Shoes. The shoes. Yeah, right back to shoes. Uh, spark plugs. Some of the best things, because they're concentrated, don't take a lot of space, and have a 25 to 30 percent a year uh, increase in, in cost, which again is increase in value. Hunting ammunition, 22, 30, 30 out 6, 30, 30. Spark plugs, a real good example. Price is beginning to climb. Distributor parts, fan belts, tires, uh, flashlight batteries, keep them in the freezer. They'll keep forever if you do. Really? Oh, sure. Yeah, it, it, the colder the temperature, the longer the storage life of, of batteries. Uh, and those things are pretty concentrated, don't take up a heck of a lot of space. Uh, that's one way people with limited income can beat inflation. It's just that simple. Now, uh, there are other things you can do to beat inflation. First, don't count on the government stopping inflation. They aren't going to. They just are not. Live, we're going to live with it. Politically impossible to stop it, so you have to personally beat it. Another thing that I would suggest is that you look, that you, uh, and, they're, and they're outlined carefully in my book, there's a whole list of investments that do well when inflation is climbing. For example, gold is the world's frightened money. There's only, uh, if you put all the, the gold together, it's been mined since the world began, to be a cube 90 feet square. There's not a lot of it around. And What when, form do you buy it in? Buy it in form of coins, bullion coins. Uh, South African Krugerrands, Mexican peso coins, they're all, their price is always in relation to the value of gold with a small premium, but a premium which you recover when you sell it, because a premium goes with the coin. Mm -hmm. uh, when the world is frightened, about, either about inflation or war or political unrest, people buy gold. The Italians buy it when they think the, when the, commun they think the communists are going to take over the government and they smuggle it to Switzerland. The French buy it and hide it under their bed for the same reasons. The Arabs buy it when they're worried about war in the Middle East, and an Arab Bedouin will buy a gold chain hanging around his neck and ride his camel around with his gold around his neck. Uh, this kind of uh, philosophy that says paper money comes and goes, but gold is always there, means that it's countercyclical. Bad news is good news for gold. 
So when inflation is rising and interest rates are rising, my charts tell me that gold is in a rising trend. It goes up and down, fluctuates, but the long-term trend is up. Silver coins do the same thing. American dimes and quarters minted before 1965. Halves, too. Uh, 64 and older. They're 90% silver. Their price is in relation to the value of the silver in them. They're actually so a lot of them disappear from the market because they're melted down for their silver value for industrial purposes. Uh, you buy them by the bag from a coin dealer. A bag is $1,000 face value. It has a market value of over $5,000. If you'd bought them in 1964, you would have paid $1,000 for it. Now you could sell it for well over $5,000. 400% appreciation in 15 years would have kept you way ahead of the rate of inflation. The prospects are that the fundamentals are the same. They haven't changed, and they'll continue to do that. Diamonds, if you have money left over after buying gold and silver. Diamonds? Sure, if bought at wholesale prices. Diamonds will appreciate at two to three times the rate of inflation. May quietly. I ask a question here? Sure. I have heard, and this is just one of these little rumors that go around, and I've never taken a, never spent one phone call to investigate this, but that the, the, the South African uh, combines and what have you, that pretty well control the, the, the diamond mining. Central mining-y. selling organization, okay. De Beers. That they have enough held back to dump on the market to kill the uh, uh, to to kill the increase in value at any time that they want to is is that a fact? Can they do that? Can it they destroy the investment value of diamonds? It is a fact. They could. Now, what's to keep you from getting wiped out by them doing that? Then, well, first, I've made an awful lot of money by figuring out where people's self-interest lies and assuming they will act in their own self-interest, and then I bet accordingly. Why would the organization whose principal asset is diamonds? do something to destroy the value of their diamonds. Nothing unless they were controlled by somebody who had a much broader goal in mind than just making money for that They've organization. They've been controlled for 300 years by the same people. In fact, their control of the diamond markets is so absolute that the Soviet Union, the world's second largest producer of diamonds, sells all of his diamonds through the Central Selling Organization out of London. By the way, uh, Howard Ruff is going to stay with us till 5.30 this afternoon, so... Uh... Howard Ruff, he's going to stay with us till uh, till the 5.30 sports here on Ring Radio. That gives us a few extra minutes to take phone calls. Uh, we've moved our conversation from the causes of inflation into the area of how you can uh, how you can try to beat it, how you can prosper during the coming bad years. And uh, we'll just go straight back to the telephones. You're on Ring Radio. Go ahead. Mr. Ruff, I wondered, uh, I had two questions. Who are the people telling Carter what to do? He never seems to do anything for this country. And number two, a gold seems to keep on going up, but silver fluctuates. It was going up for a while, and now it's going back down. I suppose it's controlled. Is it likely to go way down? Well, first, gold fluctuates, too. In fact, it's fluctuated wildly. In the, it went up to two, over 250 in October. It was back down in a period of six days to under 200. Now it's back up into the two, went up to 250. It's back down now around 238. So it fluctuates, too. Silver fluctuates wildly, too. When you, that is characteristic of markets when you get into uncertain times. Silver has two forces working on it. One, it's an industrial metal, and we're at the end of an industrial expansion when the demand for it is at its peak. Second, it's a monetary and fear metal, so people are going into it because of that, and it and good news will drive it down, and bad news will drive it up. Well, do you say that uh, in, with industrial production off, there won't be the demand for it? Yeah, eventually, yeah, but Assume. but right now, industri- at the peak of a f- end of a four-year economic expansion, there is a lot of industrial demand, but in my opinion, the slack in the industrial demand will be taken up by the fear demand for silver. If you have a choice, which way would you go, gold or silver? I diversify. Uh, they serve different functions. Silver coins are small denomination amounts that are easily divisible if you needed to buy something, would if you had a total collapse of the currency. But it's also bulky. It's not a good place to store large sums of money because it takes roughly 30 times the space for a given number of dollars as gold. Because mm-hmm. gold is roughly, it's 30, 30 times more expensive per ounce, or, well, actually more than that. So I like to diversify. I like to start out with a bag of silver coins for each member of the family. Then I like to go to an equivalent number of gold coins if I have any money left over. Do you like silver money? first? Pardon? Do you like bullion? No, I prefer coins. Bullion type coins. To me, bullion type coins are the equivalent of bullion, except you don't have to have them assayed and certified when you sell it. You can just walk into a coin dealer with a gold coin and sell it anytime you want. What about jewelry? Well, jewelry only if it is. Uh, a work of art by a recognized artist in the field where it has value. I, I was looking at your ring there, which is beautiful. Yeah, I've got a gold ring that uh, my wife had me buy for my own Christmas present <laughs> from a tax-free shop on board a cruise ship in the Caribbean. Uh-huh. We had a seminar with our subscribers on board that ship, so I bought that. But 
I bought that because I it was pretty and my wife wanted me to have it, not particularly as an investment. I yeah. I could buy the same amount of gold for half the price. There's a lot better ideas than going to a foreign country for interest. In the first place, we're going to have inflation rates high enough that that 11% return isn't going to even keep you even with inflation. That's point number one. Point number two, we're going into a period of great ex uh, financial excitement in the international marketplace. Now, you're talking about we're going to do this. How long a period of time are you talking about? I mean, do you think we could... Uh... Would you believe next month? Maybe? Two months? Six oh, months? Oh, uh, imminently then. Imminently, that's right. The inflation rate... Uh, well, you, the Consumer Price Index in the news broadcast just a few minutes ago was uh, showed that on the wholesale level, the wholesale price index, the uh, annual increase of 12% a year. Uh, the January figures indicated anywhere from 12 to 16 percent per annum. That's the rate of inflation now. 11 percent return, especially if you're going to pay income tax in the United States federal government on that profit, uh, means it's even less than that. You're going to lose money. Second, in a period of great international financial instability that we're going to be running into, I think it may become difficult to move money across international borders. And I have a bias in favor of having my money where I am. Well, we're doing it illegally now, let's face it, you know. Yeah, okay, well. But well, my question, well, what I wanted to say is this. At least uh, over there, um, we'd be making more. And I understand what you're saying about the interest going up higher. Uh, I mean, the inflation rate going up higher than the interest that we could be getting on it. Sure. But... Um, that's that's better than nothing, isn't it? Well, you know, well of course it's better than it, more. it's better than not getting any interest. However, it, there's a thing that's even better than that. That's good capital gains, uh, capital appreciation. The name of the game today is not income or interest. The name of the game today is capital appreciation. Stick with things that are going to go up in value faster than the rate of inflation, fast enough to compensate for the rate of inflation and the interest you're not getting. So you go into precious metals. There's a lot better ideas than going to a foreign country for interest. A lot of people thought it was neat to go to Mexico uh, uh, a year, year and a half ago, and then the Mexicans devalued 40 percent and ripped off the gringos. There's always a reason for high, uh, uh, for high return. Whenever there's a high return, there's almost always a high risk attached to it when you have a fixed dollar-denominated investment or denominated in any country. And you are going to feel silly a couple of years hence if you find out that you've got all this money in the foreign bank and you have absolutely no way to get into this country and use it. Okay, last point. Uh, when the United States catches a cold, the rest of the world gets pneumonia. I happen to think this economy will be the most stable of all the economies, and I'd rather have my money in countercyclical investments in this country. The only justification that I could think for having money overseas would be to take maybe a small percentage of your liquid assets, send it to Switzerland. Uh, you can have, have it in any currency you want over there. And then if the government does something stupid, like uh, freezing money in bank accounts to prevent runs on the banks, which they might, uh, at least you have some money sitting over there where you can decide whether to comply with some dumb, dumb government order about what you will or will not do with your money. At least gives you time to think about it. But a small percentage of your holdings only. 2619764's number uh, small uh, of your holdings. You're not saying that people should not have a savings account in a, in a local bank, are you? I am. You are. No savings account. No what? savings account. Uh, I, I've always felt, and tell me where my reasoning is wrong and how you would, uh, how would you ac accomplish the same objective. Have three months living expenses in a savings account where you can get it immediately. Okay, there are better places to put it than in the bank. Okay. Right now there are money market funds. These are mutual funds which invest strictly in short-term, high safety, high, highly uh, liquid Securities. They'll buy treasury bills, 91-day treasury bills. They'll buy maybe a, a bank acceptance paper. They'll buy corporate paper. Strictly high-velocity money market instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, the yields on these funds run anywhere from 9 to 11 or 12 percent. They're instantly liquid. You can get your money out of it any time you want. In fact, they even issue you checks, which you can write against your account to draw funds from it. Checks any check over $500. They, uh, it's the same as having an interest-bearing checking account, and it yields higher than any savings accounts I know right now, simply because short-term interest rates are so high that you can buy these money market funds. They don't charge commissions. Uh, they make their money by taking one half of one percent of the assets of the fund, but they yield so high that you still net out a, a very high return. Uh, Dreyfus Fund, for example, their uh, liquid assets fund. The Capital Preservation Fund in California, which invests in nothing but treasury bills. You, if you have don't have enough money to buy treasury bills at $10,000 a shot, you can put your money in capital preservation fund. Much better place than banks. We use it in my business. I have a large publishing company publishing my newsletter. Uh, 
we maintain our the necessary money necessary to maintain an orderly business, an orderly checking account, in that fund. We transfer it into the local bank strictly as a, as a transfer to write smaller checks. All large checks are written directly off that fund. Yeah, I was wanting to know about the monetary supply. When you increase the money supply by 5% a year, it, they say it's not inflationary. Is that true? Huh. Well, theoretically, if the economy's need for money is growing at the same rate, that should not be inflationary. That's the theory. That's a monetarist theory. The, the, but now you run into some complications. There are other things that affect inflation, not just the amount of money, but the velocity with which it moves through the economy. One dollar spent twice is twice as inflationary as one dollar spent once in the same period of time. When people are, when the inflation rate's rising and people are trying to buy things and unload their money and it moves through the economy rapidly, that's highly inflationary. So 5% increase in the money supply could be highly inflationary if money velocity is high. In addition to that, we've all, uh, the money supply creation is not under the control of the Federal Reserve. They try to push the buttons, but there's some buttons that don't work. Uh, we've created some 700 billion euro dollars overseas that are not reflected in the money supply. Uh, we did it by loaning money or by sending money abroad. It goes into European banks. They loan against it. They're not required to maintain reserves against it like the Federal Reserve does. The Federal Reserve doesn't control it. They create money at will. Foreign banks create dollars at will. See, most of the money is neither printed nor minted. It's just computer entries in banks. If I have a thousand dollars, and put it in the bank. You ask me how much money I have, I'll say, well, I have $1,000 in the bank. But you can go into the bank and borrow 850 of that $1,000. The bank can keep 15% as a reserve. And then I ask you how much money you have, and you say, I have 850 And then somebody asks me how much money I have, I say, I've got $1,000 in the bank. Nobody printed any more money, but there's now $1,850. Yeah. And then that gets spent and into someone else's account and borrowed against and so forth. The European banks do the same thing, except they don't have to limit themselves to loaning only 800 and eight, eight, 850. They can loan the full thousand on who knows whether or not they might be loaning 2,000 because it never gets called on them. It's just created. It's in the banking system. Monstrous amounts of dollars sitting out there. The amount that this Federal Reserve creates, whether it's five percent or maybe even zero, uh, could not, maybe wouldn't slow inflation if all those dollars came sailing out of those central banks in Europe if they went to another reserve currency other than the dollar which they're contemplating and working on now. Okay, I wanna, before we go, I want to uh, ask you to tell people how they can get your newsletter because I've seen it. It's very informative. It, it, it really is and it's for everybody. The people with a lot of, lot of beanies and the ones with just a few. In my unbiased opinion, it's the best newsletter ever written. How well, if that? you didn't think it was, you in ought to my, stop publishing in it. In my humble opinion. Okay. How do you get it? Well, you write to me. Uh, Post Office Box 172 in Alamo, California. We have a, we printed a 64-page highlights of, from my first two years of my newsletter that uh, we have a surplus supply of. We'll be happy to give away if anybody wants any. Send me one. Yeah, sure. 64-page highlights. Just drop me a note to Howard Ruff, P.O. Box 172, Alamo, California, and ask for the best of Ruff. I bet you were responsible for at least 90% of the mail volume in Alamo, California. Oh, we are by far the biggest single uh, mailer. In the, we're, we're the, uh, yeah, we probably are. If we, you just send it to Rough are. Alamo, California, you'd get there, wouldn't it? <laughs> you <laughs> probably would. Okay. Howard, I want to thank you uh, for coming by and especially for spending the extra time. I know you had some friends waiting for you. And uh, if you're back in town, I know Chip Wood is, is quite jealous because you were on my show and not his. But if you're back in town, I hope that you will call. Let us draw straws and one of us will have you back on the air again. Delighted to do it. And remember, there's... Uh, Got a lot of listeners here. I want to come in the spring or the summer. I'll come if you can find somebody who'll take me bass fishing. I've wanted to experience uh, southern bass fishing. Yeah, well, uh, we have people that can do that too. Thanks for being with us. You bet. Sports is next. We'll be back. That box number for the uh, for the uh, Howard Ruff, by the way, is box one seven two Alamo A L A M O, California. Don't do that, Frank. That's disgusting. That is revolting. I've got to sit here in this chair looking at you through this glass window and watching you. That's terrible. Ah, goodness. 24, uh, <clears throat> 24 minutes until 6. Excuse me, I had to reprimand my director here. You're on Ring Radio. I sat here through everybody. Been on since 4.30, Neil. Oh, well, that's the, that's the way the old pickle you know, squirts. Anyway, so it didn't matter. Yeah. Listen, I got a couple things to toss out to you. The Marta thing, you got me mad on top of mad. So last time I didn't get to talk to the Ash. I didn't know you were a, you were a member of a wife-swapping outfit. Uh, wait a minute. Who told you that? Well, I never mind who told me, but I didn't realize it until this afternoon. Uh-huh. Well, we won't get into that either. Is that a play on words? Yeah. 
Well, go ahead. Okay. What I was going to ask the guy was, and I, I'll ask your opinion about it, I'm of the opinion that being a non-smoker and non-drinker, uh, when the collapse comes, and it's going to be a collapse, uh, it's just right through the bottom of the tube, uh, you might as well have a good stock of booze and cigarettes around because those people aren't going to change their habits no matter what. And you'll be able to barter for good things like food and, uh, you know, gasoline and things with your cigarettes and your booze. And uh, I'm also, of course, I also got my, like the guy said, I've stocked up on my ammo and my guns and my, my food and good stuff like that. So I think if you get yourself set to make it through without your money, you can always barter and come out ahead. And I don't know what you think, but I'm, I'm planning to do it that way. I, I am going to start doing that. Uh, I'm not going to do it as a hedge against disaster, but I am going to do it. I'm going to follow some of his advice. Like go out and buy a, uh, a box full or a gross of flashlight batteries and, and spark plugs. and, and uh, I'll have uh, my Chrysler probably for a couple of years. So go out and buy five sets of spark plugs for it and do it now. Uh, right. uh, maybe a couple of hundred uh, rolls of toilet paper and paper towels. Paper products are going up very fast. and that Also, like in my case, I've got an older model car. A lot of folks laugh because I haven't traded my car in. But it's an old old model, four-cylinder, gets good mileage, and it requires only four spark plugs. And it's one of these ones, you know, I can, I can totally dismantle and work on myself. And uh, I've, I've kept that. It's worth maybe $900, but you get uh, into a situation where the gas is real hard to come by, and you've got a car that you can pull spark plugs out of clean and regap without having to buy eight brand new ones. You're going to be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And I'm also stocking up on some other things people haven't thought about, uh, like communication equipment, uh, radio equipment, and other things like this that's well, going to be necessary. Also things like knives, uh, sharpening oh, yeah. stones, uh, uh, stable foodstuffs, bags of rice. You know, all, all of this comes into play. Supply of food down there. I got all that stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like I got my, my handguns with the holsters and enough ammo. It comes down to it. I can trade off some ammo for food. Well, you, you could. Know? That That is something that I really like. I like to barter. Oh, I love it. Now, you know... That's how I got my wife. I saved the coupons. Did you really? Yeah. Hmm. She didn't come in a box of cereal, did she? Uh, the Cracker Jacks. Uh-huh. Did, did uh, uh, what? Did you get my letter? Yes. That's why I was mentioning the wife swapping club. That's why. Are you going to bring that up later? I think you should. I thought that was kind of fat. I, I don't know. How would it do me any good now? You mean, well, how would what do you any good now? I'm not, I'm not following you, and I know it's my fault. Okay, say the money. Okay, so you're, you're telling people to go invest their money in houses, land, and this. I am? Well, you were saying it last week. Well, I, uh, I don't know that that's as a, a good hedge against an absolute total collapse, but then I don't... Uh, I'm not saying that we're going to have an absolute total collapse. But the best thing is gold. That's something you can keep, right? Well, yes, that is one of the things, but you wouldn't want to have it all in gold either, would you, sir? No, I don't think so. But I still can't understand. There, you know, say something, you do all this, and you lose your job and can't pay you, you know, pay your bills and things. How what would you do? They'll take it back. Well, that's uh, that's right. If you if you had a house and it cost you or some land and it cost you X number of dollars to to uh, service the debt on that land. Maybe you ought to have enough stored away where you can service that debt for six months down the road if you were to lose your job. Okay, if you put money in the bank, if the bank crashes, will, you get, will your money be secured? No. <laughs> okay, let's, let's talk about that. You know, you hear the FDIC? Yes. Okay, savings insured by the FDIC and what have you. There are $750 billion in savings in the banks in this country, approximately. Okay. $750 billion. Now, how much money would you say the F the FDIC has to back all that up? I don't think they have half that much. They have $9 billion. $9 billion to back up $750 billion in savings. Now, I personally don't think that there's any danger there right now. I don't think it's all going to collapse. But the way you've been talking today, Neil, has been scaring me. Well, it, it, I think that you should be alarmed enough to start working to protect you and your family uh, uh, from a possible collapse. And uh, quite frankly, I think that his book, How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years, is an excellent one. Oh, okay, then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Two six one nine seven six four. Ring Radio. Uh, a while ago when you were talking about... Uh the gold coins, you didn't mention the one that's produced right here in the Atlanta area, the gold phoenix. Well, I know that there is a gold phoenix, sir. I'm talking about 
uh, gold coins that have a worldwide recognized value that are part of the currency of, uh, of the official currency of, uh, of a particular nation or country. Well, it would be equal to the Cougar end, would it? Well, I don't know if it is or not, sir. I'm not that familiar well, with the Phoenix. Well, they're in uh, ounces, you know. And I, I would say to you, and I'm not, you know, if gold is gold, let's face it, but I also will say to you that if you happen to be in Brussels, Belgium, uh, uh, and you need to deal in Krugerrands, uh, they're going to know what a Krugerrand is there. They may not know what a Phoenix is. Well, I believe they would because it's stamped, you know, in the ounces. It's mm. not as... Well, of course, that's that's all it would take if it's stamped on there. Fourteen minutes until six o'clock, and you're on ring. Now, I reference yeah. the lady caller before. <clears throat> you can buy gold pesos. Uh, I know my dad's got one that he wears around his neck. It's a 50 peso. And it's worth about two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Uh, uh, somebody says it's worth about, uh, like face value, about eighteen dollars. Mm -hmm. But you can get gold pesos. Oh, one more thing: the man you had on before, uh, your guest, said that jewelry wasn't a good investment. Well, he's wrong. Let me tell you what you can do. A lot of times, people have gold jewelry that they want to sell, and you can buy it for more or less the gold content in it. And it's worth about twice as much as what you've paid for it. So gold jewelry is a good investment it, if you it, can buy it right. It may well be if you're smart. Yeah. If you know what you're doing. Okay? Okay. Marietta Motorhomes out there, they, uh, they'll tell you how you can buy a motorhome. Talking about buying things. A lot of people say, oh, goodness, I'd like to have a motorhome. Boy, what fun that would be to go tooling around the country. Ah, oh, but I don't have that kind of money. At Marietta Motorhomes, not only do they have in stock a, a number, dozens of beautiful brand new motorhomes, but they also have ways that you can buy them that will afford you tax advantages and will put you in a position where other people can make your motorhome payments for you. Now, isn't that handy? Having other people make your motorhome payment for you? That can happen. Why don't you talk to uh, Bill Bryant? He's the ace salesman over there. He knows the business. You could also talk to Charlie Dell. He knows the business and owns it you see. But Bill or Charlie or any of the other fine crowd at Marietta Motorhomes out there in the four-lane highway in Marietta across from Dobbins. Motorhomes are beautiful. What fun they are. Going to football games, uh, weekend outings, vacations in the summer, and they're a lot easier to buy than you think they are. Marietta Motorhomes, four-lane highway, Marietta across from Dobbins. You're on Ring Radio. Uh, if Atlanta has $87 million surplus, why do they want to raise taxes? And on the other hand, where did that 87 million come from? Is that from taxes or is that taxes plus? Ma'am, I'm going to be honest with you and tell you that I have not made any sort of a study of the Atlanta budget, and I really couldn't tell you. This, uh, this didn't come in the, uh, in the, of course, the taxes is uh, in the budget, but the 87 million dollars surplus that they came to have. Well, I know what you're talking about, ma'am. I'm just saying that I haven't studied the situation, and I. And I'm afraid that I can't answer your questions. Well, don't you think we ought to do, try to find out how, why that surplus exists? I think so. I'm more interested in why the state surplus exists. And that's because the state is collecting too much tax money. Well, that 87 million though, was for the city, was it not? Hmm? The 87 million was Atlanta, was it? Well, yeah, and I guess in uh, simplified terms, you could say that if Atlanta has a surplus, it's because they're collecting too much tax money. What's on your mind today? Neil. Yeah. How you doing? Do you have anything you want to say, sir? Yeah. Then let's say it. Uh, how you like... That man, if you stuck his... If, a, if an ant walked up and swallowed that man's brains, they'd waddle around like a BB in a boxcar. And, uh... Oh, <laughs> yeah. His, his... Oh, well... That man, he has, you know, you people think, oh, that was all nasty deal getting on that guy's case and all that. That jerk has never called with anything to say. Frank, do you recognize his voice when he calls? He's okay. Ne I never want that moron to get through on the phone lines again. Because he never has anything to say. I don't care if the lines are blank. But uh, I just, I'm just tired of wasting their time on him. You know, if you, if you folks have something to say or you want to have fun or be serious or what have you, fine. But if you want to call up and make a total blivet out of yourself, pick another radio station.